from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. My name is Ned Martell. I'm the uh, editor of the style section of the Washington Post, and the Post is uh, proud to be a charter sponsor of the festival. And uh, every year, uh, Maria Rana, who helps organize the whole affair, chooses one of us from the Post and a writer, and it's like this big uh, yenta matchmaking us. And I always figure out what, what, what's the connection that she saw. And sure enough, in, in Julia's biography, it's clear that she's, she spent a lot of time in magazines, like I did, in New York. And she worked in the copy departments. And as an editor at a magazine, I know that the copy editors uh, respect standards in this unique way and perfect sentences for all these writers who are far flung and put together this package. And they have a sort of interior life that is always well known to those in, in the office, but they don't quite share readily. So it makes perfect sense that in 2002, when Julia's uh, Three Junes came out, it emerged as a fully formed novel, her first, and won the National Book Award, and led to an amazing literary career that we're still enjoying, and welcoming new readers to it every year, as this year with her publication of The Widower's Tale. So without hesitation, I uh, invite you to welcome with me, Julia Glass. Wow, this is, I, I, this is my third time coming to this festival and every time the turnout is bigger and bigger and it's so gratifying. And, um, and I'm just gonna assume that there's no doubt in your mind that I might actually be Ken Follett. <laughs> okay. I also wanna say that it should have been obvious to Ken, to, Ken that, uh, to Ned, that the reason that he was picked to introduce me is that we're both so stylish. Um, wow, you know, this is obvious to you, I'm sure, but we writers are readers too, and one of the things that's so fun about this event is that we get to meet and listen to some of our favorite writers as well. I got to listen to Suzanne Collins this morning. My son and I are, you know, who, who isn't? Big fans of the Hunger Games series. And this morning at breakfast, Rosemary Wells, came up to me and wanted to meet me, and I was just like, oh my God, the bunny planet? And you know, I have read her books so many, 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 many times to both of my sons when they were small, and um, so we, we are thrilled to be here with the other writers, but mostly to see that there are still so many readers in the world. Well, um, <clears throat> I'm a little cross-eyed because I'm actually smack in the middle of a book tour for my brand new novel, which came out two weeks ago, called The Widower's Tale. And I can tell you, now, thank you, that the number one question I'm getting from early readers is this one. <clears throat> Where in the world did I come up with my latest protagonist, this cranky, eloquent, vital, virile, romantic, snobbish, mildly chauvinistic, politically irreverent, retired male librarian. <laughs> and he's not based on Dr. Billington. So. Anyway, that is the kind of question that I most like hearing because every story I create begins with a single character. If you, the reader, can't fully enter the mind and soul of my protagonists, you don't have to like them necessarily, at least not to begin with, you're not gonna like my books. And when I get a bad review, I can always tell it's because the reviewer just couldn't stand my characters. <laughs> Often, the character's personality comes into focus first. That was the case with Fenno McLeod in my first novel, Three Junes, a good heart and a keen mind shrouded by fear and emotional inhibition. True also with Greeny Duquette, the pastry chef who takes center stage in my second novel, The Whole World Over, I wanted to write about a woman whose confidence and gusto for life define her weaknesses as well as her strengths. But sometimes a character comes to me with a predicament more than a personality. As the novelist John Dufresne likes to say, fiction is only about trouble. Without trouble, you've got no tension, no suspense, and in fact, no story. Trouble may come from inside the character, the urge to go to sea, a disturbing childhood memory, or even a disease. 
or trouble might come from outside the character. The child she gave up for adoption tracks her down. Her country goes to war. A tree branch severed in a violent storm falls on her head. Or the character might make a choice that begets the trouble, has an affair, buys a house, quits a job. But trouble is the one thing you can always count on. In fact, I've always said that fiction writers have to be part sadist because it's our job to inflict a lot of pain on the people we create. So sometimes I think of a novel's plot as nothing more or less complicated than an obstacle course, a decathlon requiring a variety of feats, some practical, some spiritual. In a Julia Glass novel, you may be sure that a number of those feats will be familial. The lucky individual who gets to run this course is always my first and most important character, who will come to me unexpectedly when I'm mindlessly rolling along in my everyday groove, showering, shopping, driving, cooking, getting the kids to school, the garbage on the street, the groceries in the fridge. From that character sprout other characters, parents, children, colleagues, neighbors, and even pets. The story of this one individual grows the way a sapling becomes a tree. The trunk widens, the bark thickens, limbs proliferate, bearing leaves and flowers and then fruit. Squirrels and birds move in. The occasional cat prowls through in search of a meal. Each of my novels, by the time I'm finished, feels like a complete and self-sustaining cosmos that I never forget the seed that one character who seeped into my consciousness. I may even remember precisely when it happened. Percival Darling, the eponymous hero of The Widower's Tale, I have to say, I love that word eponymous. It sounds like a creature from Greek mythology, like a cross between an elephant and a Shetland pony or something. I love that word, eponymous. So Percival Darling, came to me on a late winter's night in January 2005. After 24 years of living in New York City, a fellowship had lured me north, along with my family, to my native Massachusetts. My parents were still living in the house where I'd lived from age nine through all of my college summers, and I decided to rent another house nearby. By happenstance, it was the former home of my best friend from junior high school its rooms and sprawling lawns, familiar to me in a general way, but now, three decades and many occupants later, completely strange. So there was a very surreal quality to this move. So there I was, after more than a quarter century's residence elsewhere, living again in my childhood town, a place that's astonishingly rural for a community just half an hour's drive from Boston, where houses, both historic and modern, are sheltered by thick woods, or command sweeping views of pastures and placid ponds. When I was young, it was home to a lot of what I'd call barefoot intellectuals, absent-minded Ivy League professors, modernist architects, quasi-hippie lawyers and doctors married to trust fund origami artists. <laughs> Years later, through my frequent but brief holiday visits, the town had always seemed reassuringly unchanged, though I was aware that the real estate prices had soared, and if I looked closely, I noticed how many of the rustic, crooked edges on the landscape had been straightened, how the patina of things once left to the anarchy of time and weather had been scrubbed and polished. A few fine but unpretentious houses appeared to have sprouted stone pillars at the entrance to their long driveways, and the Victorian town library, where I'd spent hours as an underpaid page, a building both stately and frumpy, had received a Disney-esque makeover from a renowned architect. Tumbled stone walls had been disciplined. Trees that once formed shaggy tunnels above the roads had been tamed. Some of those roads, once narrow and chaotically potholed, were wider and smoother now. But not until I lived there full time as an adult shopping and picking up my mail at the quaintly antique post office as a parent with children in the local schools did I see how much more had changed. The social zeitgeist of the town, due to its pumped up wealth, 
seem to have become simultaneously more liberal and more conservative. The politically correct idealism of raw milk cooperatives, hot yoga classes, and composting workshops in direct contradiction to 4,000 square foot houses and gas guzzling SUVs. Taking my children to birthday parties, I discovered deep in the woods new developments of houses that looked like country clubs, complete with in-ground sprinkler systems and video surveillance cameras, with signs on the lawn reading, Save Darfur. <laughs> These people clearly wanted to have their cake and save the planet too. No longer did local teens shovel snow or plant grass. Instead, platoons of Hispanic, guard, of, of, of Hispanic workers shuttled back and forth on flatbed trucks with squadrons of lawn equipment. Some of the changes I saw were simply a sign of the times, but some of them felt like a sign of a decadence portending a fall. Here's something that particularly amused and annoyed me. The abundant wildlife attracted to the ample woods and swamps, which back in my childhood was taken for granted as something to celebrate, had become, to many new residents, pure nuisance. The deer that dependably ate all the tulips, if you were foolish enough to plant tulips, the raccoons that would raid your garbage cans, the barn swallows that, having set up house in an open shed, would dive bomb your dog and your car and your children once their fledglings were hatched, the fisher cats that would snatch any house cats left out after dark, a new neighbor of my parents complained that wild turkeys enjoying the warm tarmac in front of her garage were constantly preventing her from parking. And at one town meeting while I was there, dog owners lobbied to have horses barred from the town's miles of conservation trails. What if the horses stepped on their dogs? Or what if, heaven forbid, their dogs should eat the manure? I began to feel vaguely offended as if I owned the town, as if its citizens had any obligation to preserve the place as I had known it, my personal snow globe of lazy days reading in unkempt hay fields, surrounded by Joni Mitchell songs, rotary lawnmowers, rusted Volvos, the reassuring self-righteousness of Eugene McCarthy era outrage that typified the views of most of the residents back then except, I might add, for my parents, the token old world Republicans whose contrarian views kept me thoroughly and appropriately embarrassed throughout my teens. But when I was 11 or so in the late 1960s, a perfectly stenciled peace sign two stories high appeared on the side of a barn. So there I was, having lived in this familiar yet disturbingly different town for five months when a spectacular blizzard hit. It snowed for a day and a night and most of another day. That second night, after my boys were in bed, I bundled up and went for a walk down a long wooded lane. Now a tunnel of weighted boughs and tall banks of snow made blue by the darkness. Deep in the woods to either side, the houses glowed. Here, I thought, was the town I knew, its newfangled glossiness erased by the elements. Yet, if I looked closely through the windows, I could see the ostentatious prosperity that stood for everything I had come to despise. I recognized myself, not for the first time, by the way, as a premature curmudgeon. Not yet 50, railing against a kind of change that is, at least on the surface, harmless, selfish and myopic, perhaps, but in the global scheme of things, fairly benign. I stood still in the middle of the road, glaring into a blindingly well-lit, far too large, granite-appointed kitchen and I imagined a cantankerous, fossilized old timer, a man who can no longer tolerate how fast the world is changing around him, mostly because it's leaving him behind. And I knew that in this man, an alter ego of my least tolerant, least adaptable self, I'd found the genesis of my next novel. Why a man, not a woman, I can't say, though maybe the gender switch was a way of holding this part of myself at arm's length. I began to think a lot about the nature of change, whether it's technological, intellectual, or aesthetic, what it gives us, what it wipes out, the risks and dangers that always come 
with its privileges and luxuries. I thought too about the subtle evolution that takes place when our youthful selves, who yearn for change, who can't find or make change fast enough, turn a corner and begin to fear it. When does progress begin to resemble entropy, a threat to civilization as we know it? Eventually, this chain of daydreaming led me to conceive of the novel's second most important character, Percy's grandson, Robert, a 20-year-old pre-med student who becomes involved with a group of bold but naive environmental activists. Within days of dreaming up Percy, the title of the novel came to me as well. I'd call it, Everything Must Change. In the end, I changed my mind about that, but never about Percy. The tree that night on that road in my beloved but irreversibly altered hometown had begun to grow. And now I want to say a little bit about fiction in general and the heroes that fiction contains. Rumors about the death of fiction, the end of the novel, have become so common that they're tiresome. But it's true that one day we could wake up and find that nobody we know bothers to pick up stories anymore or even download them, download them onto a screen. I actually have a friend who told me that he read Anna Karenina in two different translations on his iPhone this past summer. It blew my mind. I think one of those Russian names would take up the entire screen. <laughs> maybe, we, maybe we'll feel a vague nostalgia for novels and short stories and for poetry too, the way you might feel nostalgic for cars of the 1950s or drive-in theaters or Polaroid cameras or, as writers sometimes do, for typewriters. Do you remember the bell that would ring every time you reached the right-hand margin, the swoosh of the carriage return? But unlike carriage returns, novels and stories are irreplaceable. Nothing we know in our culture, with the possible exception of very good movies, which, as we know, are increasingly rare, can possibly fulfill what novels and short stories do. Fiction reminds me of the space program, an opportunity for noble exploration that many people now view as, frivol as frivolous or irrelevant. Yet, if we put an end to it, we may lose forever the chance to glimpse distant realms filled with revelations that we can't begin to guess at. A friend of mine recently shared with me a graduation speech that was given by Alexis Mulvihill, an English teacher at a private high school in Berkeley, California. Addressing a group of people on the cusp of adulthood, she told them why they must keep reading books, fiction in particular, and I'm gonna quote from this. We are living through an age that feels at times like a constantly rebooting emergency. Things are dire, and then oil spills and earthquakes happen, pushing us into a new, more horrifying sense of dire. Was it always this way? I'm not sure. Maybe this is a new awful, or maybe it isn't. But I know for sure that as you move through your life, our world will call to you, will require time and effort and compassion and ingenuity from you. Some of you will go to work for Doctors Without Borders, and some of you will work on climate change issues, and some of you will become lawyers who help people in need fight a system that seems set against them. Some of you will raise children, or teach, or paint, or own a shop, and that will be the way you position yourself between vulnerability and chaos. No matter what you do with your life and your talents, however, you will need to cultivate compassion to open yourselves to people who need you, even if they are all the way across this great wide world. To be a citizen of this world with any chance of being productive or at least maintaining your sanity you will need to practice empathy and intellectual imagination. The reading of literature will help you with this because it speaks straight to the heart of your life and to the lives of everyone else around you. Reading is an, opportuni is an opportunity for the purest possible compassion, a chance to channel another life, another place, another time, another soul. A novel is like a portable church an opportunity for passion and compassion, for community, for, for communion, confession, reflection, redemption, elevation, revelation. Novels are centers of feeling and nerve, 
They are performers of our highest humanity. You will need this opportunity to practice the way the world will be. In closing, I'd like to read you part of an email I received from a friend of mine who read my new novel, A Man in His 30s. Dear Julie, you've written another marvelous book with the coolest 70-year-old I have ever encountered in fiction. He skinny dips, he flirts, he flirts when shopping for bathing suits, he is indifferent to the charm of toddlers. His story, his tale, shows life as funny, tragic, confounding, joyful, regretful, hopeful, ordinary, and even magical. In other words, life as it really is. Percy is my hero, and if he were gay and I were single, I'd be asking you for his phone number. <laughs> That's the greatest, when somebody wants a phone number for an email for your characters. Um, by the end of the book, I marveled at how many people his special combo of archness and warmth had touched. I can see Percy now, swimming across the harbor in the September sun. I know that despite his recent trials, he swims with some sense of satisfaction that he's done his best. I can only hope that I'll be doing something similar at 71. I said earlier in this talk that what I always hope is that you, the reader, will be able to fully enter my characters, but really, it's the other way around. What I want is for my characters to fully enter you. When the heroes I create become heroes to my readers, I know I've done my job. I've enlarged my reader's vision of themselves, magnified the way they see themselves in a world that is as fragile and tender as it can be brutal and frightening, inspired them to leap their own hurdles and live as gracefully as they possibly can with whatever changes come their way. Thank you. So I, I think I have time for a few questions if, if anybody has any questions at all about any of my books. Actually, I haven't read any of your books, but I might. You're here point. for Ken Follett, aren't you? You're just holding a place. I knew it. It's OK. Um, but uh, as a participant in the National Book Festival, how do you feel about the electronic readers? How do I feel about the e-readers? You know, I used to feel hostile toward them, um, as I have felt hostile toward every technological advance until I had to get it into my life. This is what I think about them. I think that any any medium that makes it easier for people to read stories um, is welcome. My only objection is the price point that's been set up by some of the merchants, namely Amazon, um, and the issues that authors and agents are trying to work out with publishers. I mean, the truth is we make a lot less money when you download a book than if you buy it, but you know what? It's great. I mean, I have to tell you, I was hugely amused by this friend reading Anna Karenina. He downloaded two different translations, and he'd go back and forth. And I just thought, OK, if that's the future of reading literature, then let's go with it. Yes. Hi. It's, uh, I enjoyed so much the first two books and the character Fenno. And I wondered where that came about, and is there a Fenno in the third novel? Well, as I, as I said earlier, Fenno McLeod, the, the hero of Three Junes, and as I think you know, he also is in The Whole World Over, yes. um, it really came out of a corner of me. He, he's sort of, he, he's a part of me that was, was a very emotionally cautious, fearsome person. I'm, I'm not quite that person anymore, though I have tendencies that way. And I wanted to sort of write a cautionary tale for myself in some ways. But he's also the case of a character that I never dreamed would become as big as he did in the book. I thought it was going to be really the story of his father. And I really fell in love with him. And, uh, and he's a character I may not be done with. I, I don't know. I don't mean to be coy, but, but I'm thinking about him a lot. Yes? Thank you for being the warm up for Mr. Follett. I think you've done a great job. Um, <laughs> Thanks. And, and first, I wanted to congratulate you for apparently writing a book about a, a, a male 
who is multidimensional, who is not perfect, but who has some positive uh, characteristics and traits, <laughs> given that an, an earlier author this morning um, seemed to have a, a very di strong dislike of men in general, as she made several comments that were not f uh, very positive about men. But my question to you has, has to do with process and what you uh, need uh, as an author. And would your satisfaction about writing your novel be as complete if there were no readers? Wow, you started out talking about my writing men, and then you're, are you asking me two questions, or, or, or you just wanted to comment on the, the no, male? No, I, I just commented on that, okay. but I wanted to ask you from your perspective as what, an author. What would it be like to have to know that I was writing for no readers? No, it, it, exactly. As a writer, is it necessary, and I think you were alluding to it a, a little bit towards the end of your presentation, is it necessary for, you, for a writer to have readers to, for the novel to be truly complete? Okay. Oh, well, is it necessary for the novel to be truly complete? Maybe not. But I will say this. The most people ask me, you know, what was the most surprising thing to happen to you as it, when you had your first novel come out? Um, it might be winning the National Book Award. That's true. But I will tell you that when I started to meet total strangers who'd invested their precious time in reading my books and wanted to meet me and talk to me about it, blew my mind. And I have to say, readers are my number one addiction. So I'd go through terrible withdrawal if I lost readers. I gotta know I have them. But you know, writing that first novel without a contract, without, you know, just in a cave was a very different experience that sometimes I wish I could recapture a little because sometimes I'd have to stop myself and not think too much about, about what I know about people who've read my books, what they expect, you know, what they hope for. Um, it, it, it's important to, to keep to keep that a little at arm's length when you write, but, um, but I, I don't know what it would be like to write my books without readers at this point. It is, I think it is important, actually. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Uh, your speech was amazing. You sort of answered my question partially. I just wondered what your inspiration for Three Junes was. My inspiration for Three Junes, oh my, well, <laughs> you know, every book is a sum of so many life experiences. You know, Three Junes grew out of a time in my life that I've often talked about. I think I talked about it here the first time I came. I had a really rotten mid-30s. Um, I lost my only sibling to suicide. I was diagnosed with cancer, and I went through a divorce. And, you know, it, it, was, it was a terrifying, demoralizing time in my life. And that's when I started writing Three Junes. But I didn't know till after it came out and people started to talk about it that it really is a book about enduring the kind of heartbreak, regret, and emotional fear that you think you're never going to get through. How, you know, and really it's true that all the novels that I love the best are about nothing more than human endurance and also our ability to rise above our own folly. I'm always interested by how, and I know this from my own life, how do really, really smart, good-hearted people make such stupid mistakes and then live with the consequences of those mistakes and live through them and beyond them? And I know that's what Three Junes came out of, but I didn't know it at the time. Thank you. Thank you. So any, any more questions? Well, I'm going to move over for Ken. <laughs> Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.